After losing her right lung to cancer, Edie became the first person in history to walk the El Camino Real de las Californias from Laredo, Mexico to Sonora, California. It's a story of what we can do when faced with the potential end of our life. Please welcome Edie, let's see if I can pronounce your name, Littlefield Sundy? Sund B. Welcome, Edie. Thank you so very much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Diana, and everyone for inviting me. And by the way, I just love your motto, rise to the adventure. Um, I'm the author of a book that was published last year by HarperCollins, Thomas Nelson. And we're very, uh, we're very uh, blessed, actually, very uh, excited when it was nominated as the best inspirational book for the Audi Award in New York uh, last, last May. Uh, it, the book comes in uh, a DVD. Harper College did a good job. It's even a CD set, uh, as well as the hardcover. And uh, I do have a, a few books back there. And I also have a very handy little um, reader, a uh, square reader, in case you have a credit card. <laughs> I'm just learning all this great technology. It works really great, usually. So anyway, uh, what's a, what the book is about, really, it came about after I'd written a series of articles for the New, York, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And really, my whole life, and I think uh, the whole purpose of my life has been to, to really um, uh, talk about the miraculous healing power of walking. And that's what the book is about. And just to give you an idea... Of, of the walk. It was a 1,600-mile healing walk. And it was along an old mission trail. And I think that the where was as important as the what. But even more important was the why. And I'd like to share with you just very quickly in a four minutes what the book's all about, and then we're going to unpack it a little bit.
Okay, that's the walk. That's the book. That's everything I have to say. <laughs> so let's unpack it a little bit. Let's talk about what I learned. So why did it happen? Okay, and we talked about this a little earlier. Is in our life, we're all hit by blue sky lightning. You know that bolt out of the blue that comes in a clear day, a clear sky, when our life is going so well. And things are never convenient. And things never hit its like disease or like sickness or like tragedy. It never hit, hits us at a convenient time. And oftentimes when it hits us, it shocks us. It knocks us out, knocks us to our knees. It can be so paralyzing. Fear can be so paralyzing that fear can cause us to give up hope. It can trick us into giving up hope. And so what you have to do is you have to find something you grab a hold of. And I, I think someone just mentioned Victor Frankl today. His whole thing was meaning, in search of meaning. You have to have something bigger, bigger than what you're going through. Something bigger. Something to make, something to look forward, some, to get you out of where you are, out of the abyss. Well, for me, it was stage four cancer. And when it was discovered, it was gallbladder cancer, which is a sister cancer to pancreatic bile duct and liver. And it's actually one of the most lethal cancers, even more lethal than pancreatic, because when it's discovered, it's already spread throughout your body. When it was discovered in my body in 2007, it was in eight organs. San Diego was just willing to do palliative care. They were talking about no treatment, just palliative care. They didn't think I would live long enough, actually, to be treated. And of course, uh, at that time, I, I thought uh, three months or a few months wasn't long enough, and so I, I, I aggressively sought out treatment. I had advice at MD Anderson. I had advice at Sloan Kettering in New York. But I found Dr. George Fisher at Stanford Cancer Center, who told me that he could never cure me, but he would treat me to the best of his ability. And that's exactly what he has done. And he likes long-term relationships with his patients. Find a doctor like that. <laughs> and so we fought. And uh, we fought and we fought and we fought. Well, of course, the patient, we have to do our part. We're a big, big part of our own healing. And one of the things that I discovered right from the very get-go was that if I can move, I'm not sick. If I can move, I'm not sick. But if I can move, also, I'm not as afraid. The minute you start moving, you're not as afraid. And of course, doctors know that movement is wellness. You go in for, you've had a heart attack, you've had major surgery. As soon as you're out of the intensive care unit, they're going to get you out of that bed and get you to start walking because the body heals with walking. The body heals with movement. You know, Hippocrates knew that walking was the best medicine. And it's actually the most prescribed medicine in the world for a reason. So I wanted to live. I wanted to live so, so much. I was even willing to put rocks in my pocket to get more chemo. Now, a lot of people, chemo has a really bad rep, and it is a pretty bad thing. It's kind of like Drano. <laughs> but, but you're not drinking it. You're not drinking the Drano. It's actually dripping through your veins. But and because it's dripping through your veins, it's toxic. So what do you do? Well, it's going to kill the chemo. It's going to kill the cancer. And you have a choice. Cancer's going to kill you. Chemo might kill you. Will kill? Might. I opted for the chemo. But I knew I had to be smart about the chemo. And again, I used movement. Right after I had an infusion of chemo, and I had an infusion of chemo every three weeks for almost six years. Almost a million milligrams, 79 rounds of chemo to get me through this, because it keeps coming back and coming back and coming back. During this process, I lost 10 inches of colon, a couple of inches of stomach, I lost 60% of my liver. The cancer was even wrapped around my bile duct, which took some radiation, very serious radiation, to, to try to kill it from there. And also then it came back and it raged back, and it, I, had to, I lost my right lung as a result. It's also been in my throat. I've had throat surgery. So it keeps coming back. So you, know, you have to keep fighting it. But the chemo would allow me an opportunity to fight it, to stop the growth, to shrink the growth, and then to have surgery. And so one thing I found about chemo, like everything, is you want the chemo to come in, you want the chemo to kill the cancer, but then you don't want it to kill you. So how do you do? Well, you drink lots and lots of water, you get out, and you sweat it out. When they mix the chemo, they put it in with uh, dextrose, and so you've got this high, it's a sugar high, for about 48 hours. At the end of that 48 hours, you can't even get out of bed, you can't even crawl up to the restroom hardly. 
But for that 48 hours, you do have a bit of adrenaline, a bit of dextrose, a bit of sugar high. So you get out. I drink voluminous amounts of water. I'd put on my, my gospel music. I'd go out to the canyon, and I'd walk, and I'd walk, and I'd sweat it out, and I'd sweat it out. I got that chemo out of me. Kill the cancer, but then get it out of me. And I did that for six years. After uh, Stanford took out my right lung in 2013, I had a lot of healing that I needed to do, and I didn't want to have a diminished life. And so in order to not have a diminished life, I needed to have pretty normal lung capacity with the one lung. And I knew exactly what I needed to do, because I'd been doing it all along. But I needed to ratchet it up just a little bit. It was time for me to walk. And so I knew exactly where and where I wanted to walk. I wanted to walk the old El Camino Real Mission Trail. I could see the bells, and you have the bells here. I could see the bells from where I walked in the canyon. I could see the bells when I drove up to Stanford surgeries for cancer treatment. I could see those bells that the people in California put on the sides of our roads starting in 1906. They're almost every mile along the old El Camino Real, but it's along the old road. The old El Camino Real really doesn't go along the road, as I found out. But there's 21 missions, 21 missions along the old El Camino Real from San Diego to Sonoma. So you have 21 destinations. It's not like 800 miles. It's 21 missions. And so I started to walk with a purpose, a meaning. And the walk was so much bigger than what was going on inside me. And I was just happy to be out there. I was so joyous and so grateful and so thankful to be alive. And I really didn't care. I truly didn't care if I completed the journey. <clears throat> Just being out there was good enough. And so I started to walk. Yes, you recognize this. Beautiful, beautiful. But the old Mission Trail is not just beauty. It's across creeks. It's up mountains. There's five, six mountains between here and Sonoma. And of course, some of the times you're, you're in unpleasant places like right next to an Amtrak train coming at you at 90 miles an hour. They make no sound, by the way. You cannot walk on the tracks. That's a good way to be killed. You figure all these things out. The most dangerous thing, though, out there, you know, you, you realize very, very quick when you're a walker is that you're the, most, you're the least important person out there, which is a good thing to know. It really, truly is. The most important person out there is the 18-wheeler. The second most important are the, are the motorcyclists, then, then the bicyclists. And by the way, you're the last, and get out of the way. And the reason you have to get out of the way is because you're endangering other people's lives if you don't. What if a big 18-wheeler swerves to miss you? Okay? And so you realize that. You become allied, and you're looking around every which way at all times. It's in the now. It's in the, you've not met it. Walking is meditation. Your body is always in the present moment. It's our mind that's not. But when you're walking, your mind is in synchrony with your body. It becomes in the present moment as well. And of course, there are beautiful bridges too. It's the most amazing walk. Have you ever thought that San Francisco is the city of St. Francis? No. Have you ever thought that San Diego is the city of St. James? <coughs> Have you ever thought that San Juan Capistrano is named after a very, very famous mid mid-century uh, bishop. All of these names, San Luis Obispo, San Luis Rey, San Rafael, San Fernando, in a three-month period of time in 1769, exactly 250 years ago, this summer is our 250th birthday. 250 years ago in a period of three months, just about everything from Los Angeles to San Francisco to Monterey, to, 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 San, to San Juan Capistrano. All of these places were named. Every creek, every town, every mountain. Well, it wasn't really any towns back then. <laughs> but they became towns, didn't they, like Los Angeles. Los Angeles was nothing for over 100, 150 years but a little river. <laughs> now we know what it is. But anyway, I would walk, and I'd, I'd come to... I had a friend who loaned me his camper van. And a friend uh, from Oklahoma came out and drove the camper van for me for a period of time. And then, then Dale was able to take some time off work, and he came up and drove it for, uh, for a couple of uh, about 200 miles. But that's what I would do. I'd walk at the end of the day. I'd walk to the camper van, and that's where I would sleep at night, alongside the road, in vineyards, 
in strawberry fields, in state parks, on mountains, on old stagecoach roads, really quite special. And of course, there are 21 missions, and I would get to a mission. And in the mission, I would light, and I'm not Catholic, by the way, but I'd light candles, candles of, of uh, gratitude and thanksgiving, just for being alive. And, and there at the missions, the Franciscans still run most of the missions. There's only two of the 21 missions at the state park that run, and that's in Sonoma and in Lompoc, La Prisima. All the rest are actually active parish, priests, uh, parish uh, churches of the Catholic Church. And, 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 and you have your Franciscans. The Franciscans would welcome me in. They would give me something to eat. They'd give me something to drink. And then oftentimes I would stay actually at the mission that night before heading out the next day. And then I got to Sonoma. And what a relief that was. What a surprise it was, really. You know, my feet had stopped hurting after about the first 500 miles. And, and, and that's what you realize, is when you're walking, you're healing. And so my, my toenails would turn black and they'd fall off. I'd keep walking. My, my feet would blister. And, and, and I'd keep walking. They would heal. And I'd feel like, I sometimes going up a mountain, I couldn't even breathe. I had this one lung. And it was only six months before that Stanford had taken out my right lung. And so it would hurt so bad, and I couldn't get a breath, and I'd feel like, I'm going to pass out. But I didn't pass out. I just kept walking a little slower, but I kept walking. And I kept breathing. And when I got back to San Diego two months later at UCSD Medical Center, they did a, a test of my lung capacity with one lung. I was 80% of normal lung capacity. And I maintain it every day. I still walk in the canyon every day. Oops. Oops. But when I got to Sonoma, one of the most important things, one of the most highlight of my trip was Sally Canfield Coupe was there from Paradise Valley, California. She was in the same hospital room with me at Stanford with gallbladder cancer stage four. And she had her left lung removed the very same day that I had my right lung removed. Now, she couldn't go out there and walk with me that 800 miles. Not physically, but she was walking with me in spirit. And when I arrived in Sonoma, she was right there to give me a hug. And I must say that I've never felt more joy in all my life as I did in that moment. And I don't know if I will ever feel that level of joy again. It was the pure joy of just being so it took me 55 days. I walked on average 15 miles a day. It's amazing what you can do one step at a time, one day at a time. But you know, I stopped walking. I didn't really want to stop when I was in Sonoma, but I'd reached the end of the El Camino Real Mission Trail. So I stopped in Sonoma, and sure enough, you know, lightning doesn't just hit us once. <laughs> Out of that clear sky, it hits us multiple times, doesn't it? And I knew it was going to hit me again. Dr. George Fisher at Stanford knew with stage four cancer, it's not curable, okay? It always comes back. But I had a plan for when it came back, and it came back two years later after Stanford removed my right lung. It came back in the remaining lung. It came back in my left lung. We treated it at Stanford. I can't have a lot of surgeries because I'm missing a lot of body parts. By the way, there's fewer places for the cancer to hide out. <laughs> but, but, so, but we treated it with high-intensity radiation. It was a singular tumor. And by the way, Stanford keeps a very close eye on me. I'm very, very blessed because I have an incredible team there. Every, I see them every three or four months. We keep a very close eye on things. And as long as the cancer behaves itself, it comes back and it's just a singular tumor, one or two, we've got it under control. If it comes raging back, I've got it under control. I'll just start walking. <laughs> okay. So anyway, I knew the old mission trail didn't start in San Diego. So when it came back in my, my, my left lung in 2015, I knew exactly what I needed to do. You know, we think we have all the time in the world. We don't. So I didn't speak Spanish. Okay. When I started the walk from San Diego to Sonoma, that 800 miles, I'd never walked more than four miles in my life. It's not something you can get in shape for. It's not exercise. It's just something you do 
And then you just have faith. And you just, it's uncertain. But I'd, been, I'd gotten very used to uncertainty in dealing with cancer. Okay, so I went down to, uh, I got on a plane in, in Tijuana, across the border in San Diego, got to Tijuana. I took a Mexican flight from Tijuana down to, Sino uh, down to Loreto. And I only had two things promised. I had a vaquero, a cowboy, for five days promised. And I had a pack mule promised for 10 days. And that was really enough for me. I knew I didn't have time to learn Spanish. I knew I didn't have time to make intricate plans. I didn't have time for a lot. I just packed a few things, very, very few things. I've learned a lot about essentials because I can walk 100 miles with nothing but what I can carry in a 22 pocket fishing vest. I wrote about it for the, the, the Wall Street Journal, how you even cut off the handle of your toothbrush. <laughs> Because after hundreds of miles, even an ounce starts to weigh on you. But you get used to what's essential. Very, very, very few things are essential. So I knew that down in Mexico, okay, that it was wild country. And, and actually, in 1967, the Copley Foundation sent an expedition down there for California's 200th birthday in 1969. Two years before the 200th birthday celebration, Helen Copley said, we want you to go down there and find the old Jesuit El Camino Real Mission Trail. No one's really been down there and looked at that. We want to see where Junipero Sierra walked. We want to see where Portola, Juan Crespi, Galvez. We want to see what they did and what they endured on the way from Loreto up to San Diego in 1769. So she sent a group of about a dozen people down there to try to find the old El Camino Real. And many books have been written about that. The nice thing about that, I'm kind of losing it here. <laughs> Whoops. Because this side fell off. Oh, well. this side fell off. Oops. Sorry about that, guys. Thank you. The nice thing about those books is, is, is they, they put together some hand-drawn maps of the old El Camino Real Mission Trail. And that's what I carried. I carried that these are the only maps that really exist. And this is the map that I carried, you can see it's tattered, that I carried in my pocket. Another thing I carried with me is I carried a GPS system, an iridium that connects with the iridium satellite system, which uh, the US government explorers, uh, diplomats use all over the world because uh, it's, uh, it's, the, uh, it's the military satellites. And and that would, and I would ping my GPS location once or twice a day. Dale had a map on his computer at home, and he'd get my ping, and he knew more about where I was than where I did. Also, took with me some medicine. I never told Dr. Fisher at Stanford what I was doing, because you know he he worked so hard to keep me alive. He would have thought this was foolish. He always said, don't do anything foolish, and I never told him. But I did tell his physician's assistant, Annie Johnson, and she was well-trained in wilderness medicine, and she actually had this list called Dr. Donner's Wilderness Survival Kit. She called CVS with all the doctor's orders to, for this medicine, and I, since I didn't know Spanish, this is my list, and I actually translate into Spanish because maybe I could read it to the guy, like if a rattlesnake bit me, or if I, you know, a, a mule kicked me in the head, or I broke my back, or whatever, or it was bad water, or whatever. I could at least try to make out this is what I'm supposed to take and when. But I had more pills with me than I did pesos. <laughs> How many pills do you think I took in two months out in the wilderness? None. Go figure that. Okay, like, like in, in San Diego to Sonoma, I knew that again I would walk one day at a time, one step at a time, and God would decide, like he does for each and every one of us, how long and how far. And I knew uh, also up there, when I, by the way, I met with Harry Crosby, who had written that wonderful book up there and who did those maps. He's 94 years old. He's still alive, and he lives in San Diego. I met with him before I went. I said, hey, Harry, I'm going to use your, your maps, and I'm going to try to do this. Uh, and you did this uh, 70 years ago. But I said, do you have any advice? And he said, yes. I said, never go in the desert. Never go in the Sierras without a man born in the desert Sierras. And these are the vaqueros. He said they'll protect and guide you. And they certainly, certainly did. And I have no idea. I never communicated with them. They communicated among themselves. Now, it took 20 of them because a vaquero in the desert and in the Sierras, they know every thorn. They know everything in a radius of about 30 or 40 kilometers. Outside of that, they don't know. 
and they know they don't know, and they will not go outside of that because that's when you die in the desert. That's when you die in the mountains and the Sierras is if you go outside of what you know. And so I, I come to the, I, I just, along in these old desert, and these desert places, these mountain passes would be another vaquero and would be another fresh pack mule. And that was for two months and for almost a thousand miles. It just happened. I knew that I'd be uh, intense. Sometimes I'd be sleeping in the sand on a sweaty mule blanket. In 1908, the American Geographical Society called Baja California, Mexico, the least known territory of the world. You know, it still is. The Jesuits, the missionaries down there, had a little more explanation for it. They said it's the most miserable, wretched place. <laughs> because it's nothing but thorn. This is not the Mexico of the beaches. This is not the Mexico of tourism. This is the real Mexico. The only way you can do this is with a pack mule. The only way you can do this, sometimes the mule can't even, you have to take a burrow. The only way to do this is to walk because as the Jesuits were road builders like the Romans, they built those straight through the Sierras and those roads go straight through the Sierras. That's a meal. It's 2,000, 2000 feet straight down here. Right down there is a place called Paradise, El Priso. It took, and it's hell to get there. It's always is hell to get to Paradise. <laughs> but here, that's what the trail looks like. I had a little limpic tough camera. That's all I had. Nothing fancy. A limpus tough camera around my head. The big problem here and throughout the place were the rattlesnakes. If I, you know, because rattlesnakes are everywhere. You can't see them. Of course, they see you. And you just hope and pray that nothing really bad happens because that's a, not a really nice thing to happen in the middle of nowhere. So anyway, yeah, this was the wilderness. This is the wilderness. It's what California looked like. It's what San Diego looked like. It's what every place here looked like 100, 150 years ago. And the Old West is disappearing here. It's disappearing very fast, but it's still alive south of the border. And the old Mission Trail is absolutely incredible. You know, two, two and a half million people this year on the Pacific Crest Trail. Almost three million are out there on the Appalachian. 500 people summited Everest. Do you know how many people are on the El Camino de las Californias? That's the place for me. We can't even see our wildflowers anymore. The soft souls of man are destroying our wilderness. They're destroying our wild. There's something in our heart. We need wilderness. We need the wild. And we're destroying it. And I, that's why I hesitated to write the book. I hesitate to even tell about this. There are crazy people out there who want to do this on a motorcycle. Sorry, they're crazy people. No, he doesn't. But they're crazy people who want to take an SUV out there. You know? No, this is the wild, this is the wilderness. Take a mule, take a donkey, walk, see it as God intended. You can see what God had made when you're walking, you can see what man has made if you stay in a car, a truck, or a motorcycle. The trails there are like they were 300 years ago. And, and back then, mules were known to fall off the trails. You can often have a, an 18-inch trail and a 1,000-foot drop, and a mule has to make it on that 18-inch trail. So there's, there's a lot of slippage. There's a lot. And when you're not in the mountains, when you're not actually up on those trails, this is what's down below. These are arroyos. And, 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 uh, and the desert, whenever it gets water, it may not get any water I mean, for seven years. But when it gets water, it's like here, it floods. That's why they have concrete on the, the Los Angeles River that concreted the whole thing. Because it used to flood the entire city of Los Angeles, and it would continue to do so, except we've controlled it. Here in the wilderness, the water is not controlled. Of course, the biggest thing there was the cactus. Cactus is everywhere. It's a cactus jungle. Cactus. The El Camino Real Mission Trail is under this cactus. And this is my shirt. I have my shirt. I brought two shirts with me. This is the first one. 
it was totally shredded in three days. Not only was my shirt shredded, but I was shredded. Of course, I've always found in life it's as difficult to go back as it is to go forward. So you just go forward. And when I went forward, and as I got more into the Sonoran Desert, got out of the cactus jungle, you're in a different kind of jungle. But the cactus is taller than you are, and it takes shapes, weird shapes. Nature is so profoundly beautiful. There's death everywhere in the desert. It's a reminder. It's a reminder on the impermanency of life. It's a reminder on seize the day, carpe diem. The most essential item that we have is free. Free. And that's water. Water, water, water. You realize in the desert how important water is. When you go 200 miles and there's not a speck of water, you realize how important water is. And I wonder every day when I turn on my faucet in San Diego, if no water came out of that faucet, how long would it be until there's mass civil disobedience? I'd give it three days. And by the way, you might want to be looking around where your water is. There's some water out here. But you might want to, be, you know, in case you turn on the faucet sometime. Because there's water everywhere. But God, we're in our cars. We're driving 60 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour. We don't see the creeks. We don't see the rivers. We don't see anything. We see nothing around us. Nothing. We're in our boxes. You have to get outside the box. I gave that to the curator. He had no idea what I was saying, and he didn't have any idea how to hold this little Olympic stuff camera to take this. But and the mule, I had to push the mule out of the way. By the way, I pushed the mule out of the way every time we came to water so I could get water. I drank next to the mule, and I never had a problem, never had a digestive problem. And this is after having radical, radical digest, uh, 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 gastrointestinal surgeries. Let, you know, losing part of my liver, part of my stomach, part of my colon. And I never had a problem. Of course, there are a lot of things there other than a lack of water. There's a lot of wildlife. There's snakes, there's centipedes, there are giant centipedes. They're called giant centipedes, by the way, they're enormous. And, uh, and then, of course, you have the, the scorpions, the nest of scorpions, a lot of rattlesnakes, uh, mountain lions, all of those things. But the most dangerous thing is always, is always men. Men are always the most dangerous when you're out alone or wherever you are. Because I don't know what it is about men. Some of them have evil hearts. The evil heart today is narcos. And the narcos in Mexico are in the arroyos. They're everywhere. And we were warned. And, and I never saw any. I never had any indication that the carols, there were never a problem until we got within 300 miles of the border. And then progressively more and more and more narcos. I even had a vaquero leave me in the desert because the narco had warned us to get out. The, the, and the vaquero wanted to go back. And I said, no, I'm going forward. And that was my decision. He wasn't going to risk his life for some gringa. And I, I, I really respected that. I write about that in the book. And people say, oh, my God, he left you. How awful. No, not at all. That was my choice, not his. We all only make our own choices in life. And, but the, the narcos, okay, what's happening there is, is, is to supply the, the, the homeless in San Francisco, the street people in San Francisco, to supply the people in Hollywood and Beverly Hills with their whatever, their cocaine, whatever. It's absolutely wrecking havoc on peoples all around the world who are supplying the drugs to us for our insatiable habits. And, and I think that you know, that's one of the biggest moral problems there is in the world today. And the greatest evil, cancer's not an evil. Well, it is an evil. It is an evil. But I think the drugs are just as bad. But apart from the drugs, you know, and all of that, the dangers of rattlesnakes, the giant centipedes, what you have is so much beauty. You're just surrounded by beauty. And what you also have is your angels. And St. Francis of Sales, St. Francis said, make yourself familiar with the angels, for they're with us all over, everywhere with us. 
And when you're out vulnerable, you're all by yourself. And you're out in a strange country, on a strange place. You don't even speak the language. You meet angel after angel after angel. <laughs> and it, the women in the ranchos, so poor. They don't even have any electricity. And by the way, you realize what a world is like without electricity. It's black. It's dark. And that's why the vaqueros, when it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you stop. I don't care where you are. You stop. Because you've got about an hour, hour and a half before it goes black. It goes dark. And so you've got to be someplace safe, protected from the desert cold. It can be 110 degrees during the day. At night, it's freezing, freezing, freezing cold. More people die of cold than they do of heat. One out of four people will die of heat. Three out of four will die of cold. And so you want, you know, it's, it's, I can't even tell you how freezing cold it is. But back to the angels on the trail. Now, this is Maria Luisa. And she, she uh, is using a flashlight. I came in at 6 o'clock. She had already gone in for the night. She got up. She, she wanted to fix some coffee for me. She fixed me coffee. She had a little bed. Her bed was a concrete block with some planks on top. And she had a little, some sheet blankets. Do you know what she did that night? She moved over on those planks, and she made room for me and my sleeping bag. How many people would do that? A lot. A lot. It's interesting, because 99 out of 9%, 99.9% .9 of the people we meet in the world are wonderful. It's, but it's that one-tenth of one percent that we remember. And we can't do that. We have to hold on to the angels. And, and, and that's why people say, well, aren't you afraid? Uh, I guess after stage four cancer, you're not afraid of a whole bunch. But no, I find that the way to deal with fear is to face it. And once you face it, you realize that fear is not in the moment. Fear is in the mind. And so once you, again, once you start to move, you, you're not as afraid anymore. And anyway, so you also have all this beauty around you to, 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 to elevate you above, above the... Above the Whatever. The, 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 my, my friend calls it the, the holy and the ordinary. You know, we're always looking for something extraordinary when everything that's ordinary is really <laughs> profoundly beautiful. And one of the things, though, that is extraordinary but profoundly beautiful down there are some of the missions. And most of them, some of them are made of the rock and sand. By the way, the Jesuits built this out of the lava rock and out of the sand of the desert. They didn't import any of the materials to make this. Now, the, the altars and everything, they brought in on pack mule from the mainland of Mexico. And out in the middle of the desert, in a silent desert, you'll see an old, all that's left may be just a bell tower. But it's so profoundly beautiful. But most of the missions down there, look what I missions would look like if the people in California, the civic organizations, the Landmark Club, and the, um, the um, uh, California Federation Women's Clubs and the, uh, Golden Women, the Women of the Golden West and the Sons of the Golden West, they rescued our missions from this starting in the 1900s. That's what our missions would look like. That's what some of our missions did look like before the great people of the state of California decided they were the greatest art treasures we had and to preserve them and to rebuild them. But that's what they look like, most of them. But you know, I love ruins. I love ruins as much as the other missions. Their spirit remains. Spirit never dies. And so I got to the Tijuana border with my last vaquero, Pancho Duenas from Maniadero. And Pancho left me there because you cannot take a mule across the border. <laughs> and so, uh, and it was Christmas time and the border was absolutely crazy. And so, and so then I, I went back a, a, a short while later and I completed my walk from the border to the mission San Diego. It's 19 miles um, there. I, 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 I completed the walk where I had started, which was mission San Diego. And thus my mission walk was finished. And here's the GPS uh, little pings from Mexico. And the GPS pings added up to 972 miles. Again, it was about 58 days of, um, of, uh, of going. And, and um, I was on a mule as much as I walked. I try to walk every single day, but there's just some of it you just can't walk. And it's interesting, they say that Junipero Sierra walked 24,000 miles in his life, mostly on foot. <laughs> So anyway, that's it, uh, uh, my adventure. One question I'd like to leave you with today is, is this quote from Mary Oliver, 
And we lost Mary Oliver last month. She's such a famous poet, fabulous poet. And this is from her poet, poem, Summer Day, and which she asked in the poem, Summer's Day. She said, tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Not do tomorrow with your one wild and precious life. Not do this afternoon. What do you plan to do right now with your one wild and precious life? You know, Mae West put it really, really nice. <laughs> you know, you only live once. But if you do it right, once is enough. Rise to the adventure, guys. Make this once is enough. I know what I'm going to be doing. And guess what? I was in St. Augustine, Florida, on the book tour. I was in Florida, and, and I discovered that there's a mile marker in St. Augustine, Florida. And guess what it says? Old Spanish Trail, zero milestone, St. Augustine, Florida, to San Diego, California. Yes. So let it come back. Let it come back. Let me tell you what I'm going to be doing. Okay. And by the way, if you've read the book, if you liked it, if you'd say a few words on Amazon, that's always very, very much appreciated. And that's it. Just, how are we doing for time? People call, they have cabalgata riders, and a cabalgata is Saints Day. And the, the people in Mexico throughout the Spanish-speaking world, the Saints Days are fab days of e enormous fiesta and celebration. And so they'll ride on horseback on the old mission trail between the missions. Down there, there are 18 missions. Well, 17. 17 Jesuit missions. Mm -hmm. And so, Sinovio, uh, who connected with Dill, who he speaks no Spanish at all, and Sinovio speaks not one word of English. And so, Dill would have his little, uh, he had his ping, and he kind of knew where I was. And so, Sinovio would connect with him. Sinovio was a cabalgata writer, and Sinovio would, would get the vaqueros he, when he could, he'd get the word out that I was coming through. But then they got the word from each other. I mean, it's one rancho after the other. The ranchos have been there. These people have been there for 300 years. They live exactly the same way. They, they braid their own lariats. Not only do they braid their own lariats and make their own bridles, but they actually tan the leather. They kill the goat. They kill the sheep. They kill the, the, the bulls, if you will. Uh, and they do everything. They're in the desert, but yet they, they have their own irrigation systems. They have their own, uh, um, they grow their own food. I've always said, if North Korea nukes us, head south. <laughs> the vaqueros, I know exactly where I'm going to go. I know exactly which vaqueros I'm going to go to. Okay. So there yes. was water within the desert? Okay. Water. What happens in the desert, it's called a cistern. It's called a tanasha. They are T-I-N-A-J-A. -A. It's, oh, it's like a cistern. So when the water, in, water may have it every seven years, but it's, it's like bedrock. And so the water will, until it evaporates, it will be in the, okay. So the vaqueros think they know where it is. They know where it was the last time they were there, but it may not be there. However, the mules and the donkeys almost always know where it is. And it's interesting, if I could show you the videos, a lot of some of the videos I have, almost always the vaquero, the, the donkey or the mule, the pack mule is not on a tether, or is not on a lariat. That mule is running wild. That mule, that burrow is taking us to water. Because they can, I don't know how they do it, they can smell it. And once they've found water, an animal, and also they like to go wild. They'll run wild on you with all your gear. You've got to watch them a little bit. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, so, so, but there were moments, there was one place, there were 200 miles, there was no water at all. 200 miles. 200 miles. And uh, that's right in the heart of the Sonoran Desert, just north of uh, Catavina. And, um, so there I had, uh, I got them at REI. I had four of them, and they were 10 liters. So I had 40 liters of water. And, you know, it's interesting what you can do, like I mentioned there, with one cup of water. One cup of water. Okay. Now, um, I, got, I would get uh, food from the ranches on the way, but I discovered that even burritos turn green after two, two days in 120 degree, 110 degree heat. But, you know, your food turns green. You know something? You eat it anyway. And you know some? It's not all that bad. 
In fact, I took a lot of meals ready to eat, this Mountain House stuff. You see it on the REI and all the stuff that meals ready to eat. By the way, also my boots were, uh, the, they're the Loa Renegades by a company in Austria, but they were made special for the British uh, uh, Special Forces in North Africa. And so I had a, one of those boots, the desert boots with me. Just one pair, and it lasted the whole time. And I had some of these meals ready to eat. The thing is, the Vicaros would eat the stuff. I mean, and then, you know, and it, you know, you know, what do you do when you're out in the middle of the desert and you're with a vaquero and you, he won't eat the food you have? <laughs> well, you know, um, yeah, you know, you eat, uh, you, you let him have the moldy burritos and you have the, you know, whatever. <laughs> so is the water safe to drink in those cisterns? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. No. No, but I did have a little. It's a little. Um, um, uh, it, uh, it was. It was. A, had a UV light on it, and so uh, when I had an opportunity, I'd fill it with water and I'd do the 60 second UV light. Um, uh, it's just a little thing on top, but I had. I had no. You know, I, I had no electronics whatsoever. You know, for uh, these places don't have electricity. They don't have. You know. What's 30 to 40 kilometers? 30 to 40 kilometers, that's about 25 miles. Okay. Yes. With You've been to Loretto, huh? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, my boyfriend, have you heard of Knowles? It's a um, it's an outdoor program, so he um, backpacked through the San, San Martires mountain. Like San Pedro Martir. San Pedro Martir. Yeah, that's uh, closer to the border. Uh, that's where uh, Rancho El Coyote and Rancho San Jose Melling is. That's a very popular place because it's, it's only 150 miles south, 200 miles south of San Diego. Yes, yes. Um, I was just wondering if you had done any hiking or backpacking before. No. I, I know. Actually, that's an excellent question. No, I actually, Dale, uh, Dale had an old uh, tent. He does a lot on his bicycle and motorcycle. And so I just got his tent out of the garage, set it up in the kitchen one time before I headed down to Tijuana to get on the plane. Um, you know, again, you think you have time for everything. The cancer had come back in my remaining lung. We'd treated it at Stanford with high-intensity radiation. And I wasn't going to wait around to see if I was going to have an it explode in my left lung like it did in my right. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I knew I'd rather die on a mule in Mexico than in bed at home. So, you know, you know. <laughs> These, these are, uh, oops, these are Loa Renegade. Uh, these are the uh, best-selling hiking boot in the world. By the way, these are rattlesnake gators that you buy here. They're worthless. <laughs> yes, uh, you, because, yeah, they're, yeah, a rattlesnake go right through that. Uh, down there, they act, everything is bull hide, six-inch bull hide, six-inch for the thorns and for the, okay, but anyway, so, yeah, these are, as you can see, I don't know if you can see this, but they're, 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 uh, yeah, because you have, the biggest problem walking is sprained ankles. Oh. And I tell you what, I've sprained my ankle so many, and that lava rock, the first four days, the first, with, by the fourth day, I slipped on lava rock, strained it so bad. I probably broke something in my foot. It was black and blue and pretty much swollen the entire time. You just keep walking. And, and you know, you have no choice out there, so you just keep, and it heals. It's just amazing. I have no problem with my ankles, and I've had severe, 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 severe uh, problems. The your feet, that, was during the that was chemo. That was because you know it's interesting how cancer works. Is cancer wants to kill you? Okay, uh, you know, uh, and delay plus denial with cancer equals death. And I've learned that walking. If I can move, I'm not sick. If I can walk, that I can stay alive. So what does cancer do? What does it do? It goes after your feet. <laughs> you know, but a lot of that is chemo. That is, yeah, it, the capacetabin, that's the kind of chemo that I was taking. It did that to my hands. I don't know if you noticed that first picture there uh, on the film. It's the abyss. With my hands, my feet, and my hands looked like that. I had no skin at all. It had completely, the, the chemo completely and the cancer completely destroyed. Yeah. Yes. Okay, we have time for maybe one more question. Yes. Was it hard to make the decision to leave your friends and family to do that? Not even, not even a minute. And I tell you why. Your family wants you to be 
happy. You want your family to be happy. If our families are happy, we're happy. If we're happy, our families are happy. Now, deal, deal, you know, we've been married 44 years, okay? And, and, and by the way, going through cancer with somebody is worse on the family than it is on the person going through. It's wrecks havoc, wrecks havoc. And, and, and you cannot, you cannot just rely, you cannot lean on your caregivers. You have to lean on yourself. You have to lean on your faith, you know, uh, because they can't bear the burden. It's too great for them. And, and no, uh, walking makes me happy. Walking makes me healthy. Would you rather have me out walking 1,600 miles or in bed where you have to change my uh, plastic panties after chemo, which is the truth of it, the truth of it. It's, it's a nasty, nasty. It, cancer's nasty. But walking, okay. movement can move you beyond that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Edie. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you.